The part of the chapter I want to focus in here on chapter 2 of Colossians. Look down at verse number 4. It says, In this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. So he's, he's writing them and admonishing them and, and trying to warn them, say, it, you know, people are going to be coming with enticing words, things that might sound really great. And, he, and he's kind of warning them here. Let's continue reading here. Verse number 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. He's saying, just as you've received Him as your Savior, as much as you put your faith and trusted your soul to our Savior Jesus Christ, as much as you've done that, He says, so walk ye in Him. Don't just let it stop there. Continue to walk in His ways. Verse number 7, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And, and He goes further here saying, you know, that you need to be rooted down. You're saved, yes. Continue to walk in His ways and get rooted and planted and fixed in the steadfastness and, and being built up in Jesus Christ and in everything that, in all that He is about and in all of God's words. Verse number 8, another warning, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. There's a lot of people teaching all kinds of different things out in this world. There's a lot of philosophies. There's a lot of you know, traditions. There's a lot of things that people teach and believe in, but we need to beware of those things when they're not after Christ, especially when it's contradictory or doesn't line up with God's Word. Right. Now, I thank God we've got an awesome church here. I think this is the best church, Word of Truth Baptist Church here. We've got a great, I mean, we may be small, but the, but the people here, the members here, I believe every single one of us uh, are, are completely in line with the name of our church, with Word of Truth, that we are all interested in the truth. We are believers. We, we have put our faith in Christ for our salvation, and we want to be completely rooted and founded in God's Word, and that we believe that what this book says, regardless of what anybody else says, regardless of what the world thinks, regardless of these philosophies and traditions that are out there, we're going to look to this book for all of, our, uh, all of our wisdom and our knowledge and everything that we believe in comes from this book. Now I'm saying all of this and, and I'm, I'm starting off with this warning that the Apostle Paul started off with to the church at Colossae because the subject matter I'm going to be teaching on this evening is one that I have heard very, very little about overall in, in churches in general. And the topic matter for tonight is slavery. Slavery and, and how it fits into the Bible. And um, slavery and self-ownership is, is the title of the sermon this, morning, this evening. But so many people, I think, avoid this topic. It's one of those things that the philosophies of this world... Has, has portrayed slavery in a certain light. Which And look, Royal, I'm not just saying that slavery is good, but what I am saying is let's get what we believe about every topic from the Bible and start off without any presuppositions and just let's look at God's Word. If we want to know what we should think or what we should believe about a subject, let's get it from God's Word. Right. And regardless of what other people say or think, hey, whatever this book says, I'm going to stand by this. Amen. Because what happens today, and, and I've brought this up on many other topics too, where the atheists and the God-haters and the people that hate the Bible, they'll bring up certain portions of the Bible to try to throw it in your face and say, oh man, do you believe this? I can't believe that. You know, do you believe that a, a child that, that smites his father or his mother should be put to death? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Because that's what God's Word says and that's what it teaches. So yes, I do. If, if anyone's going to throw something at you and say, well, do you believe this? If what they're saying is actually what the Bible says, then yes, I do. Right. Because this is the Word of God. And I'm not going to stand in judgment of God's Word like as somehow I know better and that my morals and my own, whatever my heart feels or thinks, is superior to what God's Word says. So we need to have this type of an attitude just right off of the bat, especially when we touch a topic that, you know, the whole world, there's a lot of philosophy about, about uh, slavery in general, but we need to look to see what does the Bible talk about and what does it say. Now, 
right off the bat, the word slave or slavery or anything that's, that's uh, rooted in the word slave, in the King James Bible, it only occurs twice. There's only two references. One's in Revelation and the other one, I think, is in Jeremiah. And, but most of the, the modern perversions have slavery all over the place. Now, I think there's a very good reason for that. Obviously, the King James translators knew of the word slave, but they didn't use that word. And I'm gonna, we're going to look at this. This is going to be kind of much more of a Bible study tonight to really get down to the root of this and look at all of the significant chapters and, and, and portions of Scripture that deal with servitude, that deal with being um, what the Bible refers to as being a servant. Okay, what, what, and there's going to be places where we're going to see that... Um, Servant is similar to, to, to what we would think of maybe as a slave, but we need to judge everything, first of all, just based on the context. It, well, I did a, a word study on the word servant. Servant comes up all over the place, and the majority of the times you find the word servant is being a servant of God, a servant of Christ, a servant, you know. And, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're a slave. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 19. We're going to see one, uh, just one reference here. Just to show you that when we, when we read the Bible, and especially when we're looking at some of these, these terms, we have to take everything in the context, right? I mean, that's how we derive our definitions and, and how we understand what it's even talking about. It's all based on context. So servant is one of those words that you can't just say, every time you see the word servant used, it just means slave. Or every time you see, you know, no, it, it depends on what the context is within the chapter. So Genesis 19, verse number one, the Bible reads, and there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. So what's he doing? He's being hospitable. He's being friendly. He sees some strangers come in, and you know, who cares? What, you know, the, we know what the story is all about, but basically in the context, Lot sees these guys coming in. He knows they were from out of town. He knows it's not safe for them to be out in the streets in Sodom. So he's saying, Hey, Come into your servant's house, basically saying that I'm going to serve you, right? I'm going to host you. I'm going to serve you. Is he saying there I'm going to be your slave? No, of course not, and especially not in the way that we understand the word slave. So there's one example of just using the word in context. Anybody could figure that out. I mean, you, you, it doesn't take a theologian to figure out what he's talking about here, right? But turn, if you would, now to 2 Kings uh, chapter... No, actually, just turn to Leviticus 25. I'm going to read for you from 2 Kings chapter 4. Because in the Bible, there's different types of servants that are even mentioned here. Other than this type of a usage of just being hospitable towards someone, you know, that's one usage of the word. But when it actually refers to like a servant in the context in which we're going to study tonight, which would be some type of indentured servant or some type of, you know, I hate using the word slave, but it, you'll, as we get through this, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about with, with the definition, the understanding of what the Bible is referring to. Because the atheist will tell you, like, oh, the Bible condones slavery. And they'll just throw the statements out there like that to try to make you look bad because the philosophy of this world is saying, you know, all slavery is bad, everything's, you know, wicked, but... Again, the word slavery, I don't think, is a proper definition because of the way that everybody thinks of slavery. I mean, when you think of slavery, I know when I think of slavery, and probably everybody thinks this way, you think of the black man just getting beat in the fields and just being completely oppressed and, and you know, whatever. I mean, th that's the image that get conjured up in your mind. You hear the word slavery, that's what you're thinking of. You're thinking of the worst of the worst. But what we're going to see in the Bible, and the Bible is referring to Slave, what, slave, servitude, being a servant, in God's law, in the book of Leviticus, we're going to see that that's not the picture that God is painting at all, that that is not what he's referring to, and actually the Bible is against that. So if that's what you're going to call slavery, the Bible is against that. But we're going to see what the Bible actually says about all of these things, about being a bond servant or being a hired servant, and what that means. In 2 Kings chapter 4, I'll read this for you. You're turning to Leviticus 25. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible reads, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. 
And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. So here's a woman whose husband had just died and he had taken out loans. He had creditors. He had people that had loaned him some money, right? And what's happening is, well, the husband's dead. He's not able to pay on those debts anymore, but the debt is still owed. So he's going to come and say, okay, well, you have two sons. Now they're going to come and work for me. They're going to be my bondmen because you owe this debt. Now, by and large, this is what the Bible is referring to when it's talking about servants in what the false versions will call slavery. Now, I'll ask you this question. What makes more sense to you? Just, just think about it. What makes more sense? If someone owes you a bunch of money and they can't pay it, does it may, is it better for that person to actually come and work it off for you? Or does it make more sense for that person to just get thrown into jail and sit in some jail cell somewhere where they can't produce anything and can't, you know, you're still out of your money? Right? Does that, does that make any sense at all? Of course it doesn't. Or even to just say, well, I'm going to file bankruptcy and then I just don't owe anybody anything anymore because the government says I don't, I don't have to. I don't think that's right either. The Bible is, is very clear on our own individual responsibility. Us being able to take care of ourselves, work for ourselves. You know, the Bible says that if you, if you don't provide for your own, especially those of your own household, you're worse than an infidel. Very strong work ethic on being able to provide for yourself and for your family. Now, there's also a lot of love and compassion and mercy from the church on those who can't make it, those who are widows, those who are fatherless, and that type of thing. But if it, makes, it only makes sense that if you get yourself into debt and you borrow all this money, instead of, you know, just making do with what you have, if you, if you get to the point to where you know what, you have to borrow money, that someone could come back and say, look, you're not paying me, now you have to work for me. I mean, it makes sense. And this is one of the, the main, there, there's two types of servants, basically, we're going to see in the Bible. And when we go to Leviticus 25, we're going to see the other one. But this is what's called being a bondman or a bond servant. Because that is more like against their will. You know, like no one's going to want to be a bond servant where you are just, you have to be there to work for them. There's, there's some force behind that of, you owe me, and now you've got to pay off this debt. And that's as opposed to a hired servant. Someone who's, who's voluntarily going in and just in, in providing work as a servant to somebody else. More like a boss-employee type of relationship there. But uh, you're in Leviticus 25. Look at verse number 39. We're going to really dig into some of the meat of the scripture regarding this topic. Leviticus 25, verse 39 reads, And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor, and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant, but as an hired servant, and as a sojourner he shall be with thee, and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. So, right off the bat, you see there's a, a clear distinction between a hired servant and a bondservant. He's saying, look, if your brother's poor, if they need to, to just come to you because they have no means and they need to work and they need to pray, you know, don't treat them as, as some bond servant. Because, you know, if someone that, that got a loan and, and now he's just forced to work for you. He says, treat him like a hired servant. Treat him like someone that's, that's just working for you and you're going to pay him some wages and, and that's the relationship you're going to have with him. And it says that he shall serve thee until the year of Jubilee. Now verse 41 says, and then shall he depart from thee both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family and unto the possession of his fathers, shall he return. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. So this is talking about the children of Israel, and God's saying, look, you're not going to treat them as a bondman because they're my servants. You'll treat them as a hired servant. You'll, you know, you'll treat them with some respect. You'll pay him. He'll work for you because he needs to work for somebody. He needs to feed his, himself. He needs to feed his family. And you can hire him, but you know, they're my servants because I brought all of you out of the land of Egypt when you were all under bondage. And again, when they were in, and I don't really have much going back to that story back when they were in, uh, in Egypt, 
but they're also servants unto the Egyptians. So that's a word that's used all throughout the Bible. Now, we know that they were indentured servants, that they were not you know, working by their will. They had taskmasters over them that was forcing them to do that work in Egypt. They were bondmen, and they were brought out of that bondage when God led them out of Egypt. But that's the terminology used. And again, we need to just make sure that every time that word's used, we're getting clear what the Bible means in the context. So continuing on here, he says, you know, they're my servants. Verse 43, thou shalt not rule over them with rigor, but shalt fear thy God. So as someone who's, who now has either a bond servant or a hired servant, he's saying you don't rule over them with rigor. And again, this is the idea that most people get in their minds when you think of slavery as someone that's just going to beat them down and, and treat them poorly and oppress them. The Bible says, don't rule over them with rigor. Now, you're still the boss. You're still the master in a master-servant relationship like that because, I mean, the same way that my boss is my boss when I go into work. When I go into the office and my boss is there, he's the boss and I'm the servant. I'm serving his needs. Whatever it is that he wants me to do, whatever, because he's paying my check. Right? He's the one writing the checks. Whatever it is that he says that I need to do, if it's, hey, uh, I need you to go in the, in the bathroom and clean up the bathroom. Well, he's the one paying my paycheck. I'll say, okay, if that's what you want me to do because I'm his servant. It makes sense. And God's saying, don't rule over him with rigor, but fear thy God. Fear God. You know, don't, don't treat people poorly. Verse 44, both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shalt be of the heathen that are round about you, of them shall you buy bondmen and bondmaids. So he's saying, you know, there's a difference between the heathen that were supposed to have been destroyed anyways and completely wiped out of the land. But the ones that remain, he's saying, you know, if you're going to have bondmen, it's okay for them, but not for any of your brothers, not for, for any of the children of Israel. He's saying that's not right. They're going to be hired servants and not bondmen. But he is, it's, it's, the Bible is, is um, allowing if they do this. And again, you have to be very careful when looking at the law. There's a difference between condoning or promoting something as opposed to just saying, this is the law, and in these situations, this is what you do, and this is what happens. Right? right? So when it's saying here, what, what the law is stating, what God is stating is that you cannot, it's just unallowed to have a bondman of your brethren. It's, it's allowable to have a bondman of the heathen, but it's not allowable to have a bondman of your brethren. Verse 45. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession. Now, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to freak out when I read these things. Because the, philosoph the modern philosophies and, and tradition, man, is going to tell you, oh, I can't use their possession. No way. I can't believe you're going to say that. You know, you can't, no, you can't own any other person. I'm going to stand with what God's Word says. Amen. Okay, I'm going to believe this book over what any other philosopher says in this world or, or, or false religion or whatever. I stand at 100% on everything that the Bible says. And if this is what it's saying, then, then it must be right and it must be true. That this, um, that this is even allowed in the Bible. Verse number 46, And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule one over another with rigor. And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family. After that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. So now this is talking about a, a, a flip-flop situation where, you know, if there's a stranger, a foreigner in the land, now is rich and they've got wealth and they, uh, they get, you know, a, a poor Israelite goes to him and he sells himself. So this is a voluntary thing that's happening. Right? This isn't something where he's being forced. It's not where he's being kidnapped and sold into slavery. We'll get to that in a little bit. He sells himself unto the stranger. He's saying, you know what? I need to work for somebody. Here, I'll be your servant. And he sells himself so he's getting something in return. Right? He's becoming a hired servant 
to the foreigner, but it says after that he's sold, you can still be redeemed. So whatever it is that you negotiated and said, hey, I'll work for you, if you pay all that back to the person that hired you, he's saying, well, then you could be redeemed and then you, you are no longer obligated to be that person's servant. So he's saying after that he's sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him. Or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him. Or if he be able, he may redeem himself. So if things start turning up and, and doing better, one of his family members, they could come and redeem him. Or even himself can just say, you know what? I don't want to be your servant anymore. And here's the money. You know, the deal is done. And, and everything is square and even at that point. And, and that's the way that works. And, and this all makes sense. I mean, if you truly have freedom and free will, can't you sell yourself if you really wanted to? I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's a good thing to do or the right thing to do, but it's something that you can do. You know, I mean, it's something that these people do when, you, when, you, when you're falling on hard times and you've got like almost nothing to do. You know, what am I going to do? Well, I need to work for somebody. Verse number 50, And he shall reckon with him that bought him from the year that he was sold to him unto the year of Jubilee. And the price of his sale shall be according unto the number of years, according to the time of an hired servant shall it be with him. If there be yet many years behind, according unto them, he shall give again the price of his redemption out of the money that he was bought for. And if there remain but few years unto the year of Jubilee, then he shall count with him. And according unto his years shall he give him again the price of his redemption. And as a yearly hired servant shall he be with him. And the other shall not rule with rigor over him in thy sight. And if he be not redeemed in these years, then he shall go out in the year of Jubilee, both he and his children with him. For unto me the children of Israel are servants. They are my servants whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. God's perfect law has made a provision for everything. And the year of Jubilee is an excellent example of that. I think I'll probably have to come up with a, a sermon here in the future just regarding the year of Jubilee and, and how, um, how many problems that solves. Basically, the year, of, the year of Jubilee is every 50 years. Debts are, are kind of um, balanced out. And here, a servant, if, you, if you're a hired servant, if you're an indentured servant to someone, He's saying, you know what? You're going to go free at the year of Jubilee. And people knew this, so they were able to make their agreements based on the knowledge of, okay, the year of Jubilee is coming up in 10 years. It's coming up in five years. So the value of, of, of what you're going to get from a hired servant, knowing they're going to go free, you know, it changes over time. And that makes perfect sense, but that's fine. It also keeps people from just being, you know, forever in servitude, for being forever just kind of kept down, right? It gives them an opportunity to, to, to still get back up on their feet and, God, and the inheritance then remains within the people that, that God had ordained for it to be with. So that you don't just have any one person buying up all the land and all the goods and everything and just coming up to this huge power, just unfettered power where, where just you have end up one person kind of in charge and owning everything and everyone else becomes serfs. In the year of Jubilee, the inheritance goes back. I mean, you could buy up land for a while and you could work the land and everything else and God doesn't have a problem with that except it goes back to the original owners at the year of Jubilee. And again, I, you know, I don't want to get too far into that because that's a whole sermon in and of itself. But um, it's an example here of someone being a hired, ser hired servant to be able to go free and, and not be held to that, to that bond at the year of Jubilee. Now, the treatment of the servant, whether bond or hired, is spelled out very plainly. We already saw one example of it, not to rule over them with rigor. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy 15. And as I already mentioned, you know, this, what the Bible is saying goes in contradiction to what the word slavery conjures up in your mind. Because the Bible is against that. Deuteronomy 15, look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, And if thy brother, an Hebrew man or an Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee, and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. And when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor, and out of thy winepress, 
of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. So here he's talking about a Hebrew man or Hebrew woman, someone of their brethren being sold unto them, right? They're coming in possession of another person for them to work and be a servant for them. At the end of their time, at the end of the, the, you know, the, the six years, it allows for them to work for them for six full years. But then he's saying, you know what? When it's time for them to go, bless them on the way out. Get, you know, be good unto them. Don't just let them go. Okay, you did all your work. Now we're squared up and leave them to go empty. He's saying, give them out of the flock. You know, get, give them a little something on their way to, to help them out as, as they're done working for you in that seventh year. That's how you ought to treat them. Turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus 21. We're doing a little bit of jumping around today, but I, I really spent a lot of time trying to find all of the references in God's law, especially regarding this topic. So we're going we're gonna to look at all of them tonight. At least all the pertinent ones. There's a couple I left out that are, that are relatively redundant where it's saying, you know, in Deuteronomy and Leviticus are saying essentially the same thing. But um, there is one place where I'm going to mention both because it gives a little bit more information. But, um, you know, I encourage you all to study this out on your own, too, when we're done with this study. Yeah, Exodus 21, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing, which is what we already saw in Deuteronomy 15. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters. And he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an all, and he shall serve him forever." So this is a situation where, again, a little bit more information we saw in Deuteronomy, but someone voluntarily goes in to work, and he works his six years. But in that six years' time, it says that you know, if he was married before that, he gets to go out with his, with, his, with his wife. But if he wasn't married, if he came into it single, and then it says, if his master gives him a wife... Now, it's not like, you know, these days we think of like finding a wife of, yeah, I'm working at this job and then I go off and there's all these, you know, women around or whatever and, and I can find a wife and marry her. He's working for someone and he's working on their land. It's, you know, you, you got to envision what's going on here. He's not just, just finding any random wife. He's being given a wife that's already in his master's household. <laughs> So it's going to be maybe another maidservant. It's going to be someone else that's already within his household that he kind of has authority over, that he's allowing her to marry this man because he loves her and he wants to marry her. And what the, what the law is stating here is that, well, when it's time for him to go free, you know, he is completely free to go, but the, you know, the woman's not just free to go because she was already a, a, you know, a maidservant. She was already... It, you know, belonging to her master in that sense. So he's saying here, okay, well, if that's the case, but he wants to stay because, hey, he loves his wife. He, you know, he, obviously, he married her and he wants to stick around, but the law says that he needs to go free after those six years. There's a provision here also then to just say, hey, I want to stick around and, and allow him just to stay under his master's roof and, and, and care and, and um, being hired by him forever. You know, and that's, that's a provision that's made here. And as I mentioned before, turn if you would now, or you were in Exodus 21. Good, stay there. Um, when the Bible says, if a man, if a man does this, if a man does that in the law, that is not condoning of what is being done, right? If a man kills another person, you take his life, right? I mean, if it, you know, this is what it's saying. It doesn't mean that you should be doing this. If a man. It simply means that if this happens, this is how we deal with it. Look at verse number 20 of Exodus 21. The Bible says, and if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod and he die under his hand, he shall be surely punished. That's definitely a sin. It's a crime. You can't just beat your servant with a rod until they die. That's against God's law and rightfully so. Verse 21, notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished for he is his money. So he's saying if he doesn't die, but he has beaten him bad, he's saying, you know, He's not going to be punished for that because 
that bondservant is his property. It's his money. Now, what he's doing, when he beats his servant like that, he's only hurting himself anyways in the long run because the whole reason you have that bondservant is to work for you, for you to get your money back or whatever. And if you're not able to, to cut it, if you're not able to make it and, and do that work now because you're laid up, you're, you're only injuring yourself and it's a pretty dumb thing to do. But also, it's not saying that that is what they should be doing. It's just saying whether or not a punishment is going to be given. And we need to do, you know, understand that. The Bible's not condoning of that behavior. But he's just saying that, look, in these circumstances, this is, this is his property. And a lot of people don't like to hear that. It's his money. But that's the way that God's law reads. And I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not twisting scripture here. This is what the book says. That's right. And go ahead and read the whole chapter and everything in context and see it. Tell me if it, if it says anything different than that. I believe what this book says. And this is where I'm going to form my opinions from. And nowhere does the Bible say that, that you should be doing these things or, or it's right that you, that you ought to be doing this. But it's simply a matter of what you do in these situations. How it plays out. Now, look, jump down to verse 26. The Bible reads, And if a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid, that it perish, so someone loses one of, you know, the eyesight in one of their eyes, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. And if he smite out his manservant's tooth or his maidservant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. So this is getting a little bit more into serious injuries. Right? I mean, if someone loses some, some other vision or loses a tooth or something along those lines, he's saying, you know what? You're just going to let him go free at that point. And that's not good for the, for the person who had them as a servant because now they don't owe you anything. You're getting, they, have to, they have to be let free because you did this to them. That is like your punishment. It's a, it's a, it could be a very severe financial punishment by not having the servant working for you anymore as your bond servant. But um, this is also not condoning of any of these offenses. It's just stating what the penalty is for committing those crimes and saying this is, how, this is what happens. They go free. Um, turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23. And as we read all of these verses, let them all kind of sink in and, and absorb the totality of what the Bible is explaining about having a servant or having a bondservant and, and what it teaches on the subject. Verse 15 of Deuteronomy 23 reads, Thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee. He shall dwell with thee even among you in that place which he shall choose in one of thy gates, where it liketh him best, thou shalt not oppress him. So someone, you know, a, a runaway servant, someone gets away from the master, saying, you don't go and bring him back. That's not your job. It's not your responsibility. You don't do that. He said, you just let them live among you, and you don't oppress them either. either. You let them do what they're going to do and treat them just like anybody else, is what the Bible says, how you treat that type of person. Flip over to chapter 24 in Deuteronomy. We're getting the picture here that having a servant over and over again, we're going to see that God's saying, don't oppress them, don't hurt them, don't you know, rule over them with rigor. They're your servant, treat them with respect, let them serve you, but you don't, you don't oppress that person. Verse number 14 of Deuteronomy chapter 24 reads, Thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gate. So here he's saying, look, it doesn't matter if it's your brother or not. If it's just some foreigner. He's saying you don't oppress them. You treat them right. Verse 15, at his day thou shalt give him his hire. Neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and setteth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. And this is teaching that, you know, uh, if when you have servants, you have hired servants, you pay them their wages right away. They do the work for you. They're poor. They need it. You know, um, many of us are in a situation where you may not need the money that day. For example, when I work, I get paid every two weeks. That's, that's the way that I get paid. I'm well off enough 
to not have to be reliant on, look, I work today and I need that money today so I could go get some food for my family. This is referring to the person that is poor and needy. Someone that's saying, hey man, I, I'm working today and I need, I, need, I, need to, I need to eat. You know, I need to provide. Those people, he's saying, you, you do that. If you have a hired servant, no matter who it is, he's saying, you pay them right away. You make sure that they get what they need, that whatever it is that they're working for you for, you compensate them. Uh, we're going to look at verse number 7 now. We're going to look at a few references where the Bible talks about making merchandise of people. Now this is getting more into the forced slavery. This is, this is the forced servitude. And this is what happened when the slaves were brought from Africa to the United States where they were just rounded up from, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, I'm not a history expert. From what I understand is that many of those tribesmen and the people in Africa were, were forcibly stolen and put into boats and brought to just various parts of the world, the United States being one of them, and being sold off there. The Bible is very, very clear. It's completely against that. That type of in, uh, forcing someone to become a slave? No. These, these matters that we saw, one was a, a result of your own actions of getting into debt where you are surety for yourself, where you're saying, you know, I'm going to get, borrow money from you and if I can't pay it back, then I'm going to have to work for you. That makes sense. And that's what's being a bondman. The other one is being a hired servant. Just I need to work for you so I can make some money. I'm not in debt, but I want to, I want to work for you and come to some agreement and I'll be your servant for, for six years or whatever. Those are, are all of these instances that we're looking at. That's what, it, that's what the, the servants were, and that's what the slavery was about. But this is the real slavery that the Bible's against. Deuteronomy 24, verse number 7 says, If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel, and maketh merchandise of him, or selleth him, then that thief shall die, and thou shalt put evil away from among you. Now, other thieves are not put to death for stealing. They have to return fourfold or fivefold depending on what they stole and everything. But stealing a person, according to the Bible, is a capital crime. It's a capital offense. Kidnapping. And then it says here, you know, they steal a person and then make merchandise of him and sell him unto someone else. That's what Joseph's brethren did unto him. Right? They, I mean, they didn't technically steal him, but they, you know, they, they, they captured him in a way. They kidnapped him and sold him unto, unto um, the heathen going into Egypt. And the Bible's completely against that. In, um, you don't have to turn out. If you turn to one more place, we're, we're almost done, actually. I thought it was going to take a little bit longer. You're, uh, you're in Deuteronomy. Just flip over to chapter 21. The Bible also refers to false prophets making merchandise of people. And I believe this is, um, well, I'll read it for you. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, Bible reads, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. These false prophets will you know, use covetousness and, and fake words to make merchandise of people. Obviously, they're after their money. But not just that. I think they kind of enslave people too. The, the false prophet is looking to control and to enslave people. And I know one of the ways they, they use is by making people think you could lose your salvation and, and you have to do all this other stuff and you have to stay in this church and you have to keep tithing and you have to do all this other stuff otherwise you might go to hell. Right? That's one of the ways you kind of keep those people in bondage. The, the false prophet will use that. Now one more mention that the Bible makes of that's against making merchandise of people is in Deuteronomy 21. Look at verse number 10. We'll start reading there. The Bible reads, When thou goest forth to war against thine enemies... And the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands. And thou hast taken them captive, and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her, that thou wouldest have her to thy wife. Then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails. And she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her, and shall remain in thine house, and bewail her father and her mother a full month. And after that thou shalt go in unto her and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. And it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whither she will. But thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her because thou hast 
humbled her. And this is kind of a little bit of a different situation, though, where you know, a uh, people is taken over, taken captive, and there's someone there that you want to actually marry, you know, there's a, a woman that's pleasing to you, and you take her to be your wife, but then if something changes later on, and, um, you know, you don't want to be married to her anymore, the Bible's saying here, you can't just sell her now as a slave, as a, as a you know, a maid servant or as a bond servant to someone else. He's saying not to make merchandise of her because you've humbled her. Now, uh, turn if you would to Exodus chapter 21. This is the last mention here that we're going to go in, the, in, the, in tonight's sermon regarding you know, being a servant or this type of servitude. And again, it's just if a man does this, if a man does that. But the question I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose is do you own your children? Because here we've, we've already seen the Bible give an example of where you can own another person, where they're your money, where they're your property, because they are a bond servant to you, because they've owed you now, you are you know, in, you know, controlling them and owning them for as long as that, until that debt is paid. Do you own your children? In uh, verse number 7 of Exodus 21, the Bible reads, and if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the men servants do. If she please not her master, who hath betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. And if he have betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. And if he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. And if he do not these three unto her, then she shall go out free without money. So, and again, I'm not saying this is a right thing to do if a man sell his daughter, but it is something that apparently happened and, and that God is giving another explanation of how to handle this situation. If a man sells his daughter, you know, as a maidservant, and basically it's to be for the purpose of being another man's wife, right? Because that's what it goes into then, where she's not pleasing her master, he's betrothed her to himself to, you know, to be his wife. Then, um, then she's able to be redeemed from that. And it kind of goes on and on in the details. But the reason why I'm even going to this now is for that question is, you know, do you own your children? And, you know, I would say according to this that, yeah, we do. We do own our children. I mean, it makes sense. You, you control, God has given you the child. You control what they eat, when they go to bed, what, you know, what they learn, and all this stuff. You are responsible for that child. Now, there comes a point when they grow up and become their own person, right? And, and, and ultimately are self-sufficient and self-sustaining and make their own decisions and whatnot. But as your children, I believe they belong unto the parents, they are your parents. But see, we live in a society today where the, this evil communistic idea that children belong unto the state is being pushed and being propagated. And this idea that the state has an interest in your children is completely wicked. It's wicked as hell. And that's where we have these organizations such as CPS, you know, the so-called Child Protective Services, that think that government thinks they have the authority to come in and just remove your child from you. They don't belong to the state. Look, the state doesn't own your children. Right. God has not given the government the authority to just steal children from people. Amen. They belong to their parents. Now, you may not agree with the way that a person raises their child or, or whatever decisions that they make, but the state is not the authority on who gets to stay with their parents and who doesn't. They belong to the parents. The, child, the parents own those children. Now, if someone breaks a law and they, you know, by severely injuring their child or something, just as we saw with the servants, you know, there's punishments that are to be made. Now, I think a child is a, is a unique situation. They're not just some bond servant to you. It's not that same relationship. But there are laws that will provide for what happens to a parent that would do something so bad to where, you know, the, the government thinks now, oh, you have to take them away from their, from their family. No, you just need to punish the crime that's committed appropriately. 
if it's some, some kind of a, a weird you know, sexual abuse going on, then that person's put to death. I mean, that's plain and simple. That's what the Bible teaches. Problem solved. The state doesn't need to come in and remove that child from the family. That person just needs to die, and then the family is you know, next of kin, and whoever is going to help to take care of those children in that event. And you go on and on down the list. And you know, in, in the cases of serious, you know, other maybe... Um, you know, serious physical abuse or something like that. You could go on with the laws that are in place, but I do not believe that it is the government's job to say, well, we actually have the authority to say, ultimately, they're deciding that, well, we're going to let everybody have their own children, and then in these situations, we're going to take them. The government doesn't have that authority to say, you know, to say how much you're allowed, how, you know, you're, how many children you're allowed to have or, or which children you're allowed to keep or you know you're living up to a certain standard and they're setting that standard right. they don't have that authority God did not give them that power and I mean you know, I brought this up in this morning sermon but this is just another aspect of that and you know in our in our government the CPS is a wicked completely vile organization that goes in and you have these many of these caseworkers a lot of them are sodomites you got these caseworkers that go in and they think that they're these big heroes and every person every case that they come across you know, the parents are bad and they just need to save those children. And then they take these children and remove them from their parents. They put them into foster care. We have a whole bunch of sodomites that, that go in to, to say, oh, yeah, I'll be a foster parent. I'll have a foster home. One, because they get money from the government in order to do it. The more kids they have, the more money they can get. So it's a financial purpose. They're not a, not a you know, a, a valid, you know, heartful, you know, uh, uh, caring purpose. Right. But also, now that gives them access as predators to these young, helpless, defenseless children whose parents aren't around and they're guaranteed not to be around yeah. because you've stolen them from them. What better situation for a predator than to be the sponsor for it? Hey, give me money, pay me from the government, and I can abuse these kids and no one's going to know about it. And it happens all the time. All the time. And then you have the court system with, this, with the Child Protective Services. It's completely, there's no due process involved at all. You are guilty until proven innocent. Parents that get their kids taken away, you have to go in and prove your innocence that you are not doing whatever it is they're accusing you of, which is completely backwards to every other court that we have where you have a presumption of innocence, where you are just you know, innocent until proven guilty. They could come in, they take those kids, and they get them to say whatever they want them to say because they're young, impressionable kids that don't even know. You know, maybe they're trying to just find the right answer or, you know, and, and, and please the person that, that's leading them down this path of what to say. And next thing you know, the kids are gone. And my word of advice is, don't, if CPS ever comes to your door, don't talk to them. Right. You get legal advice you get someone to help you to be there with you and you do not allow them in your house you do not allow them to see your children you're not because what they're doing is they're going to try to find any single reason they can to use anything against you no matter what it is i mean it's completely normal you know you could be at home and your house is normally kept real fine all of a sudden the kids come out and they're throwing stuff all over the place and then all of a sudden you get the knock on the door and they're oh this isn't a good environment for the children, you know, and it's up to whoever that person is, by the way, too. And, uh, many of them don't even have their own children. They're these younger kids, you know, and they have this ideal situation in their mind of what a child needs to be brought up with. I've heard examples of people say, you know, in a, not in the CPS case, but in a, trying to adopt children, like a Christian family wanting to adopt children and just, and just do the right thing, where they were denied being allowed to adopt a child because they didn't watch TV. Because the, the, the person who was in charge of, you know, the state representative or whatever for the, for the child was saying that, well, no, that's weird. That's abnormal. You know, you're going you're gonna to damage the child by not allowing them to watch television or something ridiculous. And, um, but this is the mindset of these, you know, the social workers and the other people, by and large. Okay, I'm not going to say every single one is evil and wicked. Okay, I, you know, I'm not dumb enough to make such a broad statement, but... The, the organization shouldn't exist. We should have proper punishments for um, laws that ought to be on the books to handle these problems and situations. And regardless of what you think should be done, the, the state does not, has never been given that authority by God to go in and remove children from their parents. It's just they don't, they don't have that power. They don't have that authority. 
Now turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We've dealt a little bit with, with ownership and, and ownership of people or ownership, being able to be owned or be property of somebody else. And I just want to bring up this point because it kind of fits in here and where we started with the, the philosophies of this world. And I'm going to talk about a political philosophy. And, and I've gone really far down this rabbit trail and I, I've been involved in politics just personally and, and kind of, it's something that's interested me for a real long time. And I am of a mindset that is very libertarian, very much freedom, freedom for the individual, which lines up with what the Bible teaches, is that we are personally responsible for ourselves. You know, we shouldn't have a government that has to take care of everything they do. We should be in a situation where we take care of ourselves and the church provides for charity and for, and for things to be able to help people out. And there's, there's all these different means, but ultimately it's a personal responsibility. And it's a lot of freedom, too. You get tons of freedom. I mean, there's certain things that are against the law, but by and large, you know what? You're free. Do what you want. Don't harm other people. You know, and, and you could choose what you want to do. There's many sins, for example, in the Bible that the Bible says are a sin, but they're not against the law. And you read Leviticus, you're not going to say, you know, you could read all throughout the Bible teaching to be sober and not to be drunk and all this other stuff, but do you know that there's not one law that's given that just says if, if you are drunken then this is the, the, you know, the punishment that you're going to pay? It's not in there. God did not make drunkenness against the law, against his, the law that's carried out by the, the people of the land. It's morally against God's law. It's a sin, but it's not something that has a punishment that the government enforces. We ought to have, I believe that, you know, the government prohibiting alcohol like it did in the 20s is wrong because it doesn't, it shouldn't have that authority. It's a sin still. I'm against it. I'm not saying we should do it, but we ought to have the freedom and the personal responsibility to take that, to make that decision for ourselves. And these philosophies, and, and especially in the libertarian, and when you get really libertarian, you get into like the anarchist type of philosophies and mindsets, they're still ultimately, at the end of the day, just philosophies of men. And what it boils down to, one of the root core principles of libertarianism is self-ownership, that you own yourself. And they kind of expand on that and say, this is a core tenet of their philosophy. And that is where, at the root, their philosophy fails. Are you in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? Let's start reading in verse number 19 and see what the Bible says about our self-ownership. Verse number 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I do not own myself. I have been bought and paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ, and I belong unto God. Amen. I am His. This body is not belong, does not belong unto me. Now, I have the will to, to make decisions in my life. God has given me that. But this is not my body. I don't have the right to just go and make my body one with a harlot. I don't have that right. God owns me. And this is the, the philosophy that, you know, the worldly philosophy says, well, you know, of, of the one that I'm talking about here, libertarianism, at the root is saying, well, you own yourself. No, I believe with all the freedom and in many of the things. Look, I'm not just saying I don't believe in any of it. I believe in many of this stuff, and that's the path that I've gone down, but it's still just a, a philosophy of man. And it falls apart, especially when you go to the core and you say, well, it's just self-ownership. Well, no, we don't own ourselves. We're bought with a price. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Our body is the purchased possession, because he's going to redeem our body. We're going to get changed. It's going to get transformed into a new body. We have the earnest of the Spirit. It's a down payment. The Holy Spirit inside of us. We have that earnest. But the full salvation 
has not happened yet of his purchased possession, when Jesus purchased us with his blood. And these philosophies of man, no matter how compelling they might seem to be, we ought not to just be deceived by them and getting so far down into these philosophies to where we're judging the Bible based on these philosophies as opposed to the other way around where we're taking the Bible as our truth and judging these philosophies based on what the Bible says. Because you can see clearly that there is ownership of men that's talked about in the Bible and referred to and that it was allowed. The libertarian principle won't, you know, would, would, would call you a heretic for saying something like that. But I'm not basing what I believe on a man-made principle. I'm basing my belief on what the Bible says. And these man-made philosophies, you know, without God, they have no way to establish their morals or even their laws anyways. There is no foundation for that. They could say, well, this should work the best, or I think this is the best, but what makes your thought better than anyone else's anyways? They have no you know, fundamental um, authority, no rock to stand on. It's shifting sand. How can you tell what's right or wrong? Who determines that? They have to rely. Yeah, we, have, we, know, we know who determines that. It's found in this book. It's the Holy God. Amen. He has determined what's right and wrong for us, and he's told us what it is. But the man who, do, who wants to come up with their own version of, of, of morality and right and wrong and laws without this book is lost. They're just, they got philosophies of men. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm preaching a sermon in part tonight just to warn you not to get caught up and be spoiled through philosophy and vain deceit like Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 says, but that we can just remain founded and grounded and rooted in God's word to give us what we need to believe on everything. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words and for the, the, the instructions that you've given us, dear Lord. This topic is, has been somewhat confused in, in this world and um, I think a lot of it has to do with a lot of preachers not even wanting to touch on this subject, maybe because they're afraid of what the Bible actually says or what people might think of them. Um, but Lord, I'm not afraid of what anybody says about me or what anyone uh, thinks uh, because I care about what you think, Lord. And I think it's important that we teach on all these principles in the Bible and that we could stand firm on your words and not let anybody shake us or scare us into, into uh, believing something that's based on man's philosophy and not on your word, dear Lord. And I pray that you will please just help us to continually seek and search out wisdom from your word and that we would put away any presuppositions or influence of the world, dear Lord, as we approach your word and that we could, you can just teach us uh, completely and, and help us to understand the truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.